At the very beginning of the 11th century, the nation of England suffered some of the darkest yet most captivating moments of its short history. Gone were the glory days of Athelstan, Edmund and Edgar, kings of the so-called imperial phase of Anglo-Saxon history, when men of Wessex, Mercia, Kent, East Anglia and even Northumbria had marched together for the first time against their enemies to the north and from beyond the sea. England had been strong back then in the first half of the 10th century, newly bolstered by warriors from the recently acquired areas of the Danelaw. Yet in reality, its unity had been relatively skin deep, kept in place only by a string of hard-headed and charismatic warrior kings. By the year 975, however, after the untimely death of King Edgar the Pacifier, the tentative balance of power within the fledgling nation threatened to break out into all-out civil war. Amidst the political squabbling that followed in the wake of his death, Edgar's eldest son, Edward, just a boy of 13 or so at the time, yet supported by England's leading churchmen, was able to win the kingship ahead of his younger half-brother, Ethelred. Probably little more than a pawn in a larger game of political theatre, Ethelred was just a boy at the time, and four or five years younger than Edward, yet he had friends in powerful places. His mother was Elfrith, and she had been Edgar's favourite wife. In the aftermath of his death, she remained an immensely powerful political figure still. On the 18th of March 978, though it remains unclear whether Ethelred took part in the act, the young King Edward was murdered in cold blood, allegedly whilst visiting a castle owned by Ethelred and Elthrith. In Edward's place, Ethelred, probably just 12 years old at the time, a boy king, was crowned. Within just a few short years, the Vikings returned. Yet this was a new age of Viking incursions, gone with the relatively chaotic warbands and settlers of the great heathen army a century earlier. In their place came highly organised professional armies of soldiers who had come for one thing and one thing alone, to extort money from the relatively weak and divided nation of England and eventually to conquer what remained. Over the course of his 38 year reign, Ethelred developed a unique reputation for indecisiveness and taking bad counsel, to such an extent that he would eventually be immortalised by the title Unread, meaning poorly advised, which eventually became the Unready. Yet Ethelred was not a weak king, nor was he a coward. He surely wouldn't have been able to reign for such a long time had he been. He did, however, suffer from a distinct lack of unity within his nation, especially from the former areas of the Danelaw, where the Anglo-Danish inhabitants now sometimes tended to support the Scandinavian newcomers rather than the king in the south. Wessex too probably remained divided amongst rival political factions, making effective and consolidated resistance against the newcomers extremely troublesome especially by the 990s and the early 1000s, when Scandinavian kings such as Swain Forkbeard and Olaf Tryggvason rampaged around the country at will, sacking, extorting, and generally causing anarchy for Ethelred's kingdom. Ethelred needed men he could trust and rely on during these dark times. He needed men who were ruthless, yet dependable, and as such, he developed a distinct reputation for raising relatively obscure minor noblemen from the dust to work for him. Possibly most famous of all these lords he raised to his service, and a man who would eventually become his chief enforcer, was the young son of a minor nobleman known to have attended the king's court on a few occasions. His name was Edric, later called Striona, meaning the acquisitive, probably because of the large properties and funds he eventually appropriated for himself some of them from church lands. Striona's father had held no titles and not much land, yet his son was ambitious. Edric Striona first appears in the historical record in 1006, when he instigated the betrayal and murder of Elderman Elfhelm of York. This brutal act, allegedly carried out after a feast, also ended in the blinding of Elfhelm's two sons. Unfortunately, we just don't get the full story of what happened, but as Elfhelm's daughter Elfgifu later went on to marry Canute, the young son of the Danish king Swain Forkbeard, sometime in around 1013, it seems possible that Elfhelm may have harboured at least some loyalties to the Danes during the early 1000s. 
and therefore stood in the way of the king's authority. Edric was rewarded for his loyalty in 1007 with the Eldermanry of Mercia, a huge prize for such a previously obscure figure. Another firm favourite of the king, Uhtred the Bold of Bambra, who had just distinguished himself after repelling an opportunistic Scottish invasion, was granted Elfhelm's lands in southern Northumbria. Both Uhtred and Edric would go on to marry daughters of Ethelred, thus becoming his son-in-laws, and probably his most important assets in the face of the ever-escalating Viking invasions. Edric's siblings too seem to have become important figures by around 1008, especially his brother Britric, who was recorded as having been dispatched south to Sussex to bring an unknown set of charges against Elderman Wolfnoth, the father of Canute's later henchman, the Earl Godwin. Edric is said to have continued to organise the murders of prominent nobles who seem to have opposed the king, right up until Swain Forkbeard's ultimately successful invasion in 1013. It remains possible and entirely likely that Edric's job as enforcer meant he was employed in wiping out any pro-Danish or anti-Ethelred elements in the English nobility. Yet it remains unclear whether this had a positive or negative effect on the king's authority. After Swain's death in early 1014, Ethelred was invited back from Normandy to become king once more. Yet just a handful of months later, Swain's son Canute returned with an even greater army to himself wage war upon England. In 1015, after Canute claimed the majority of the country and Ethelred's position seemed hopeless, Edric made the most fateful decision of his career and did as many others did during this time. He went over to the Danish side, thus betraying the king who had given him everything, his own father-in-law. Now accompanying his new liege lord, Edric rampaged through the countryside until the summer of 1016. London still held out against the Danes, however, and hope remained for the English as long as it held firm. A new leader had risen amongst the English too, and he had replaced Ethelred as king when he died in April. This new ruler was a warrior king, and seemed to embody everything that Ethelred wasn't. Edmund Ironside launched his own campaign in the Wessex countryside, bringing more and more men back over to the English side through his own charisma and actual military victories. Amongst those noblemen who went back over to him was Edric Striona, Edmund's own brother-in-law from his marriage to Eadgith. The definitive battle of the campaign was fought at Assendon on the 18th of October 1016. It was also to be the definitive moment of Edric's career and his life. The English marched in three contingents, East Angles, West Saxons and Mercians. And when the fighting became toughest, Edric and his Mercians are said to have turned their tails and fled the field thus leaving the now outnumbered English to their fate. Debate still rages as to whether this was a planned manoeuvre all along. Edmund died months later, probably from lingering battle wounds, although murder from Edric has also been suggested, such is the negativity later associated with his name. In the wake of Edmund's death, Canute became the new king of all England. Rather than continue the anarchy of the previous decades, England now finally had peace. Canute allowed much of the pre-existing infrastructure to remain how it had been prior to the invasion, whilst raising his own new men from the dust, just as his predecessor had done. Even Edric Striona was allowed to retain his position as Elderman of Mercia for a while, yet his alleged crimes wouldn't escape him for long. Canute's first wife, Elfkifu, had not forgotten what Edric had done to her father and her brothers all those years before. And likewise, Canute's new favourite, Godwin, had his own history with Edric's clan. At Christmas 1017, Edric Striona was murdered on Canute's orders at some point during the festivities, and a grim repetition of those grisly deeds committed 11 years earlier which had first catapulted him to his position of power. In the centuries that followed, Edric Striona would be regarded as one of the great villains of the Anglo-Saxon age. <laughs>